that sounds like a nice introduction there. Welcome tonight. Woo, we are excited about what God's been doing. I'm so educated, my head's ready to blow up. I mean to tell you. Hello? That's correct, right? Really? I'm trying to get I'm trying to get him down, trying to get him down. Pray for him. He's got a bum knee tonight. He hurt his knee somehow. And he's got a bum knee. He's in real pain. So he's teaching in pain. Amen. So we know what that's like. We have a book here. Henry Morris. Wow, God raised up Henry Morris. He's been in heaven for a while now. But Henry Morris started the uh, Creation Research Institute years ago and started gathering people that believed in creation. Because the world would make, you out, would make out to believe that nobody with an education and nobody that thought well would believe in a 3,500-year-old account of creation. Surely they wouldn't. And they make you out to try to be a fool, right? But they're the fool. Henry Morris, in the, in the book of Genesis, did his best work. First 11 chapters are critical critical of in the book of this is a great book this is not big doable readable man you could read this you could really read a page a day and you could read this in 100 days or so so anyways we want it back there it's a real reasonable 11 dollars. I mean you can't beat it now we're, we're, what are we trying to do? we're not trying to make money at all we're trying to leave you with something when this meeting's over so that you can keep meditating on this and get good at it and defend the faith to somebody else i Introduce to you one more time, Jeffrey Larson and the Calvary Quartet. No happiness was found within I never knew the meaning Of joy down in my soul When at last I finally knelt Contentment filled my soul Like I never felt Heaven came down There was glory all around When he saved my soul Now a life of peacefulness Deep within my heart abides Since the day that Jesus Took my sins away And to heaven I will go To spend the endless ages while they ever roll Praising his name for the glorious day that he saved my soul. I remember the day. I remember the day when the Lord saved me. When the Lord saved me. All of heaven came, all of heaven came down. I was happy and free. Glory filled my soul. Glory filled my soul. For I knew the Lord had made me whole.
Pastor Bill's favorite color tonight. Blue? Don't you oh, know great, great. Don't you know I'm going to buy him some pink jeans. I think if I bought him some pink jeans, he'd probably wear them since they're jeans, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. So y'all pitch in, we'll go to Goodwill and get him a... <laughs> anyway, all right. <laughs> all right, next song we got, Eric's done up for us very nicely. I've heard this song as a, a solo with a choir. I've heard it was a choral number. Never heard it as a quartet, so we started talking last fall. I think we were on the bus one day. I said, Eric, what about this one? He's like, never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it, we put it together, and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful song, and I hope it's a, a, a blessing to you, and then Pastor Bill come back up here in a second, but this one's called The Name of the Lord. Scott, get us going now. Crowds have lined the narrow street. To see this man from Galilee, just a carpenter, some say, leading fools astray, yet many kneel to give him praise. And in his eyes they glimpse the power that sees the hearts of all men and he knows his father's mind he speaks the father's words for he comes in the name of the Lord there is strength in the name of the Oh! 
this boy's going to hurt himself. I tell you, John, his name is John on the end there. We had a man up conference here oh, a couple of months ago. There was only two requirements if you wanted to come to the man up requirements. One of them was you had to be a biological man. The other one was you couldn't wear pink. So I'm, I think the name of these boys could be the Funny Boy Four. <laughs> I appreciate that, wearing that pink. Yeah. That's okay. You know we make fun. If Christians can't have fun, who could? If you're, if you're, for, you're forgiven of your sins, your conscience is clear, all because of the grace of God, all because of the shed blood of Christ, we receive, we don't take any credit for it. All glory goes to the Lord God. And if you can't laugh after that, when are you going to? The Bible says laughing helps your bones, and that's, I need help. So amen. We, uh, how do we pay for all this? Well, we pay for this on the love offering and free will offering of God's people. Now, if you're visiting with us, we didn't have you come to give money. We really did not. But if you're with us on a normal basis, uh, we can, you can use our, your help for these men and to help them come down. They've taken off of work. Of course, you know, they come from Indiana. They ought to be paying us. But, uh, but anyway, uh, I can't believe they come off of work and we give them money on top of that. We want to help them. And so if you, on the way out, on the way out, if you want to give something, God's moved on your heart to do it. But if, if you don't want to give something, don't feel bad and don't do it. Don't do it. Here at the gospel, we get to give. And I'm thrilled to say that our base, our base, our billboard fund which uh, we renewed again this year. I signed it today. Personally, obliged myself to $32,800. I believe we have already collected that money. That money has already come in for the billboard. So we're going to do the billboard another whole year. We're at about 2.2 million views. We're going to say abortion is wrong. One way or another, we're going to say don't abort your baby. Keep your baby. And that's beautiful. And the the land fund for Palmini has also been completed, been gathered. So if you were planning on giving to those, it's too late. You can't do it. You have to be quick here at the gospel. So anyways, those are taken care of. That's some tr tremendous things there. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Oh, we're so thrilled, so happy tonight that you came. I thought about the crucifixion again, the, the Passion Week today. And my mind, as it, as it moved along those words, my heart was filled with sorrow that the Son of God had to do that for me. But had he not done it, I'd never be saved. And neither would you. So we're eternally grateful tonight for your kindness and mercy towards us. And the suffering of this present time aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be. Help us, Lord God, to stand true and be faithful. Help us to remember what our brother's teaching us. Encourage him tonight. Heal his knee. By the grace of God, help him out of the pain. And Father, may we just go on and be lights in this world. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I sit here and think about what he has done. I start counting my blessings one by one. I sure don't deserve all that he's done for me, but I'll praise him forever, eternity. I am amazed that he takes the time Give me such blessings and fill up my life. God is so good, I cannot express how thankful I am. I am so blessed. He's given me breath 
and he's given me life. He saved my lost soul from torment and strife. Jesus died on the cross just to show me his love, and he's built me a home in heaven above. I am amazed that he takes the time to give me such blessings and fill up my life. God is so good, I cannot express how thankful I am. I am amazed that he take the time to give me such blessings and fill up my life. God is so good, I cannot express how thankful I am. I am so blessed, so blessed, so blessed. I am so blessed. got your nap today.
Praise God. We're having it was a, a lovely uh, intro. Thank you. We're having a little discussion over here of memory recall. Do you have one of those oxygen tanks that we could stick Eric in from last night? Uh, he needs an oxygen tank in there. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> he may jump it, yeah. Uh, one more minute here. He's checking into his oxygen tank little, uh, what do you got over there? No? Yeah, maybe. Imagine. Wouldn't go. Young That's people it. that you can't it? remember the words. Uh, yeah. Wow. Oh, here we go. <laughs> A request for glasses. Hang on. We... <laughs> <laughs> Because we might have got a cane and a chair. We could sit up. It's actually kind of nice because Eric, being the uh, musical genius that he is, he very seldom makes a mistake. In fact, he's the one who is the one who is actually telling me typically. He's like, John, on that last holdout, you were a little sharp. If we could just pitch it up a little bit. It was a little it was less than, you know. So he's always the one. You're like, yeah, it, it was okay. It could be better, you know. So when he does, you know, have yeah. moments of human, you know. Yeah. It shows it's, signs of humanity. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. nice. It's nice. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yes. hey. Oh, hi, Eric. <laughs> when engulfed by the terror of tempestuous sea, unknown waves before you. At the end of doubt and peril is eternity. Though fear and conflict seize your soul. But just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it of the darkest night Oh how lonely death can be At the end of this long tunnel is a shining light For death is swallowed up in victory In victory But just think of stepping on shore and finding in heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God's, of breathing new air and finding it celestial, of waking. adore him, spending all eternity praising his name, praising his name, but just think of stepping on shore and finding in heaven, of touching a hand and finding in God, of breathing new air and finding it celestial.
We're going to be do one more and be done here. Scott, get us going on this song. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. What an amazing message. He set a plan from the beginning of time to redeem my soul, and I'm so thankful for that. Forever they were banished from their paradise. God passed through Eden's garden gates alone. But his compassion wrote the pages unfolding through the ages of a love that remains the greatest ever known for God. So Shouts of praise were heard throughout Jerusalem As Jesus humbly passed through Zion's gates In the gloom of Calvary's sorrow Dashed hope so bright tomorrows When the heart of a loving Father turned away
couldn't end on a better note. Let's all stand and sing together. I believe we're going to sing a song, if I, if I remember the song right. Is that the one you're going to do? Yeah. George Beverly Shea. Very few people have a voice like George Beverly Shea had and used it for God. I'd, I remember as a kid thinking about this song and contemplating the words of it. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather him be his than have riches untold. Let's sing it together by the grace of God. 360 in the psalm book if you need it. First and last. I appreciate that. Now I introduce you one more time. Tomorrow night, don't miss tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, you're going to be in for a special treat. He left the best for last. That'll be our last night tomorrow night. Hope you can make it. We'll be here at 730. And the Crawford Quartet will be here if anything's left of them. You know what was amazed me tonight is that uh, when you forgot the words or whatever, the song, that Jeff didn't even blink an eye. The oldest guy in the whole group. God bless you. There are, I believe in miracles. I, I believe. Appreciate it. Great Amy Murtry, come on, brother. May the Lord bless you. Well, let's see how you all been doing. It's the, the middle of the week. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, you're getting there. We got, <laughs> we got one more night to practice, okay? You know, I appreciate the comments about humor, but do you remember what I said the other night? I said, no one can create anything greater than themselves, correct? Think with me. If God didn't have a sense of humor, neither would you. Because he can't put anything within you he does not have or cannot do. And therefore, God is the 
infinite source of humor. Hello. I kind of like that thought, personally. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about, quote, the road to man, unquote, question mark, question mark, question mark. What are we talking about? How many of you have heard, I'm not saying you believe it, I'm just asking how many of you had heard that apes and humans, chimpanzees, humans, share 96, 97, 98, 99% the same DNA? Come on, you've heard it, right? I mean, it's just been ubiquitous. It's not true, and I'm going to prove that to you tonight. But evolutionists will claim this, and they will use deceptive techniques to try to convince people that they evolved from apes. And for decades, they have called the process by which apes supposedly became people, they called it, quote, the road to man, unquote. Now, let me ask you, uh, do these images here look familiar to you? Come on, folks. They look familiar, right? They have been using these images since 1960 to convince people that uh, they evolved from apes. Now... We're going to talk about, quote, the road to men, unquote. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Really? Now, tomorrow night, we are going to take a look at natural selection. Really? <laughs> but that's tomorrow night. Um, but please take a look at these images for a second. When you see those images, you have to agree that there's a certain logic, that there's a certain plausibility to what you see, but let me ask you a question. Simply because something is plausible, possibly logical, does that necessarily make it true? Come on, folks. No. And I have a question for you. When they show you this, and it is very deceptive, what you're actually looking at is called stage magic. It's not black magic. It's stage magic. It's illusion. But when you see this, please tell me, how come, how come they don't show you that? Excuse me? Do you realize that for 2,500 years, evolutionists have taught that fish walked out of the water and became apes, which then later became people? There's nothing new about the theories of evolution. They go back to the Garden of Eden. And 2,600 years ago, Greek and Roman philosophers started teaching evolution. And 2,500 years ago, one of them said that fish walked out of the water and became people. And they're teaching exactly the same thing today. They may change the words, they may make it sound fancy, etc. But it's the same thing they've been teaching for 2,500 years. So let's just take a look at this. When evolutionists uh, attempt to prove to people they evolved from apes, they use four categories of physical evidence. The four categories shown up here. Number one, the skull fragments of Piltdown Man. This is called the proof by hoaxes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what is a hoax? What's a hoax? Well, I understand when you say lie, although that's not quite what a hoax is, but a, a hoax is a, it's fake, it's a fraud, it, it taint real, right? Come on, that's a good scientific term, it taint real? Well, where I live in Orlando, there's a community out towards the coast called Chuliota, and in between there's a community called Taint, because it taint in Orlando and it taint in Chuliota. <laughs> But, uh, well, there's the proof by hoaxes. The second category of proof shown here by the tooth of Nebraska man, this is called the proof by misrepresentations. The proof by misrepresentations. The third category of proof shown here by the uh, drawing of the skull of an Australopithecus, uh, this is called the proof by the bones of dead apes. Now, tonight I'm going to talk about some nice big words, but one of the things I love to do is I love taking big scientific words and making two bits out of them, hello? So I'll talk about Australopithecus. What does it actually mean? I mean, it sounds big and fancy, right? It sounds real scientific, doesn't it? Oh, come on, it does, right? But think with me. Austral is just the ancient word for southern. The southern lights are the, you know, the aurora australis. Australia means southern land. And austral just means southern. And Pithecus is just the ancient word for ape. And so really this big old word, Australopithecus, just means dead southern ape. <laughs> See how simple this stuff is? Now how did it get the name, dead southern ape? Well, it's really quite simple. Uh, when we first found them, they were dead. 
but they were found by Europeans, but the bones were in Africa. Africa is south of Europe, so they were the bones of dead southern apes. Do you see how simple this stuff is? And if you want to impress your friends and neighbors, tomorrow morning I want you to get up, go over and knock on the door and say, did you know I'm Austral? <laughs> okay, I know Florida isn't the real south. I realize that. And I, live, I just love kidding the people in Atlanta when they go up there to teach and say, do you realize I have to drive 10 hours north to get to the deep south? <laughs> and the fourth category of proof, shown here by the skull of a Neanderthal, this is called the bones of dead people. So there's four categories of proof. Hoaxes, misrepresentations, bones of dead apes, bones of dead people. And those are the four categories of physical evidence which evolutionists use trying to deceive people into believing they came from apes. Now let's just debunk them, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to debunk number two first because it's so simple, so easy, it only takes a couple of minutes and we won't have to do it again. So. What about misrepresentations? What about the tooth of Nebraska man and others like that? Well, the tooth of Nebraska man was uh, found in our state of Nebraska in 1922, declared, evolution said, a tooth of a prehuman, subhuman, living in what is now our state of Nebraska, but sometime in the distant past, correct? And they were so convinced that this tooth was the uh, tooth of an extinct prehuman that in fact, uh, an illustrator for the Illustrated London News actually drew what Nebraska man looked like. Also his uh, friend or wife, I've never figured that one out, um, <laughs> his horses, his camels, and his club, all from one tooth. <laughs> Come on folks, that's really good, isn't it? Get all that from one tooth. The problem is that evolutionists, five years later, digging in the state of Nebraska in 1927, proved conclusively that this tooth was not the tooth of an extinct or prehuman. It was, in fact, the tooth of an extinct species of pig. <laughs> so this is actually the tooth of porcine man. Okay, he was a real porker. Come on, take the one you like, throw the rest away. Um, but let's think about this. The tooth was real. It was not a fake forgery, hoax, or anything. The tooth was real. But in 1922, it misrepresented, and then five years later in 1927, corrected. And misrepresentations are just real evidence falsely presented and then corrected later, as science should. Now, let's go back to category number one, hoaxes. I selected here Piltdown Man, but let's take a look at Piltdown Man and the story of the discovery of Piltdown Man. Now, Piltdown Man, this is a drawing of the fragments of the skull and teeth as was found in 1912. The fragments were found in 1912, 1913 in an area of England that gave it the name Pilt Down, but it is near Canterbury Cathedral in the deep southeast corner of England. And the two thin skull fragments were declared to be proof of human evolution, that this was a, a prehuman, subhuman, living at some time in the distant past in deep southeast England. And the fragments were taken to the British Museum of Natural History in London and declared to be proof of human evolution. Until, until 1957. And in 1957, the evolutionists at the museum finally told the public this was a hoax. You see, in 1957, they finally told the public that the jaw is not human. It's actually that of a 10 to an 11 year old orangutan, died about 500 years ago and probably in Borneo. The teeth are not human, they are actually fossil chimpanzee teeth. And the molars have been filed down with a modern metal file to make them look flat like human teeth. But they're actually fossil chimpanzee teeth. Now the skull fragments actually did come from a human being. However, um, there's, a, well, there's a chip in the back here from a modern steel pick. And today we know this is the skull of a human being who died from bubonic plague during medieval times and had been dug out of a graveyard. How y'all doing so far? So it, it is a human skull, but only about 500 years old, uh, maybe more. Uh, the jaw, again, perhaps 500 years old, but uh, from an orangutan, actually. And uh, the teeth are from a chimpanzee. 
Aren't you impressed? Now, I'm going to show you a picture to prove that what I'm saying is true. Um, here, take a look. This is the actual jaw teeth. And notice how flat the molars are because they've been filed down with a modern metal file. Uh, the jaw, again, orangutan, the teeth, uh, again, chimpanzee. And uh, again, this was found in 1912, 1913. But the evolutionists at the British Museum of Natural History knew it was a hoax in 1923, but they didn't tell the public for 30 years. Don't you love the integrity of evolutionists? Yeah, they waited 30 years to tell the public. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight you're going to find out evolutionists love 30 years. Now, also I want to introduce to you two men. You really do want to remember their names. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, Jesuit priest, and Dr. Davidson Black, PhD in anthropology. These two men were involved with the finding of the fragments at Piltdown. So uh, again, just remember them for a little while. And to, uh, well, to summarize, it's a medieval human skull. It's about a 500-year-old orangutan jaw and fossil chimpanzee teeth. How y'all doing? Ah. Now, how do evolutionists attempt to prove the evolution of anything? Well, we're talking about supposed evolution of apes to people tonight. This is a chart from evolutionists. If you know me, you know I do not agree with the dates that are up here. This does come from an evolutionary source. But it doesn't matter whether they're trying to prove the evolution of dinosaurs, roses, frogs, people. This is their favorite method of proof, but it's the second worst method of proof in science. And so it's illustrated up here. And again, we're talking about humans and apes tonight, so that's why I picked this one. What do they do? Well, they take skulls of various primates. They take the skull of a gibbon, chimpanzee, orangutan, a gorilla, and a human. And they make the single most meticulous measurements you have ever made in your life. They measure everything you can, and then they measure it six times. Are you with me? Yeah. I mean, they make this look really scientific. But after they have done that, what do they do? They simply line them up by size and shape, as is illustrated down here. Now, here we see these skulls representing supposedly real skulls. The gorilla is not a part of the sequence. It's just there for comparison. But uh, you notice the skulls are A, B, C, D, E, F, right? And in the middle, we have what's called a key or a legend, identifying what each of these skulls is supposed to represent in this sequence, correct? So let's just take a look at what do we have here. Well, skull A, that's Australopithecus, supposedly a half a million to a million years old. Now, again, I do not agree with this. This is from an evolutionary source, correct? But this is just dead southern ape, supposedly a half a million to a million years old, correct? B is Pithecanthropus erectus, supposedly 200 to 500,000 years old. C, Homo sapiens, supposedly 100 to 200,000 years old. D is Neanderthal, supposedly 50 to 100,000 years old. E is Homo sapien variety, Neotaliensis, uh, supposedly 50,000 years old. And F is modern Homo sapien. Anybody ever here remember being taught about a creature called Pithecanthropus erectus? Anybody here remember that one? Oh. Well, let me start by saying this. When you study your Bible, you are studying about the life of the Theanthropos. Who is the Theanthropos? Well, Theos in Greek means God. Theology is the study of God, correct? Anthropos, that's man. Anthropology is the study of man, correct? And, uh, well, Erectus means walks up right here. But when you study your Bible, you're studying about the life of the Theanthropos. Now, who is he? He is the one who is 100% God and 100% man. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Theanthropos. But who is the Pithecanthropus Erectus? Well, Pitha, the ancient word for ape, correct? Anthropos, the ancient name for man. And Erectus means walks upright. And so that's the ape man who walks upright. See how easy this stuff is if you just break it down, right? Yeah. 
And, and if you don't remember that name being taught to any of you, remember about this creature being taught to you under its common name, Java Man. Anybody start to remember Java Man? Yeah. Come on, folks. We're not talking about Starbucks here. We're... <laughs> Hello? But let's talk about Java Man, Pithecanthropus erectus, for just a moment. You see, Java Man, originally called Pithecanthropus erectus, meaning the ape man who walks upright, is now called Homo erectus, or man who walks upright, but was made from a few teeth, a single skull cap found in 1891 along the banks of the Solo River in Java, Indonesia. They were found by the Dutch anatomist, Dr. Eugene Dubois, MD. Now, Dr. Dubois was a disciple of the German evolutionist, Dr. Ernst Haeckel. And Dr. Haeckel was a disciple of Charles Darwin. Anybody see a thread? Good. Now, Dr. Haeckel was a famous, perhaps the third most famous evolutionist of the 1800s behind Charles Darwin and Thomas Huxley. Um, but he was born, theoretically, in a Christian home in Germany, but was never a Christian. He is one of the few evolutionists of the period who actually earned a PhD, taught at Jena University. Um, but he and his disciple, Dr. Dubois, who was Dutch, both believed that people evolved from apes. Now, Dr. Dubois was Dutch, and in those days, uh, well, Indonesia was a part of the Dutch East Indies. It was the same country. You didn't even need a passport to go from, uh, well, from Europe to there if you were a Dutch citizen. Are you with me? Now, I'd like you to challenge yourself about your own personal commitment to Christ, okay? Here's my challenge to you. This guy so believed that if he went to Java, he would find proof of the missing link. Now, in order to do that, he was an MD. He was an MD. So let's talk about commitment. He volunteered to be a doctor in the Dutch army to get a free ticket to go to Indonesia. Come on, folks, that's commitment. Hello? And, uh, well, he actually arrived in December of 1887. Four years later, in 1891, he declared to the world that he had found the missing link between apes and people. Now, his archaeological team consisted of two Dutch engineers, prison convict laborers, and two Dutch uh, army corporals to watch the prisoners. Come on, aren't you impressed? Right? And he wanted to tell his mentor, Dr. Haeckel, back in Germany that he had found this find. You know, Eureka, I found it. Now, remember, this is 1891. And I realize that some of the younger people in the room are not going to believe this, but in 1891, there were no cell phones. <laughs> Come on, folks, there was barely a phone in Indonesia in 1891. And he has to send a telegram. Anybody remember telegrams? Re Come on, folks. Uh, do you know that when I arrived in Russia for the first time in July of 1994, they were still using telegrams and they didn't have cell phones? Oh, yeah. And so, it's very expensive to send, in 1891, a telegram all the way, you know, halfway around the world, and, and they charge per letter, correct? And so Dr. Dubois sends a cryptic uh, telegram to Dr. Haeckel in Germany, telling them he has found this. Now, Dr. Haeckel wants to congratulate his student, Dr. Dubois, and again, it's very expensive for selling telegrams halfway around the world, and so he sends him a short uh, telegram congratulating him, but I thought you might like to see what the telegram said. The telegram said this. Dr. Hegel telegraphed from the inventor of Pithecanthropus to his happy discoverer. Maybe I need to read that again. From the inventor of Pithecanthropus to his happy discoverer. Dr. Hegel had already made up the name. He simply sent Dubois out there to find bones. Hello? And Dr. Dubois forgot to tell anybody anything, and I'll bet you know how long he forgot to tell them. Excuse me? 30 years. 30 years later, in 1921, what I'm about to share with you, Dr. Dubois admitted before he died. 
You see, he had actually found a large ape-like skull cap. Today we think it's a giant gibbon. Um, well, he found three teeth, but only one was human. The other two were from an orangutan. He did find a human thigh bone, but that was one year later after he had announced the discovery, and it was located 50 feet away as illustrated in his drawing down here. He had simply put those together and made the missing link. He also forgot to tell anybody that one year earlier in 1890, he had found two totally normal human skulls at the same location. Don't you love the integrity of evolutionists? Well, let's go on. Let's take a look at this again. So what do we actually have here? Well, A is a dead southern ape, correct? But B is a hoax. It never existed. So we have to eliminate that, correct? Now C is homo sapien, but the last time I looked, that's like uh, us. And uh, D is Neanderthal, which happens to be 100% human, which means it's us. And uh, E is Homo sapien variety Neanderthaliensis, which again would be us. And F is modern Homo sapien, which is assuredly us. So what do we have here? We have one dead southern ape, something that never existed, and four humans. Yeah. How y'all doing? <laughs> I love this stuff. <laughs> now I'm going to show you a few skulls, pictures. That, I'm only going to show you two of them, but this is from a series that uh, absolutely scares me. I, I'm not afraid of the skulls at all. But what scares me is the source. This comes from Los Angeles, California Unified School District. This comes from a series called Stones and Bones. I'm only going to show you two. There was a whole set. But these photographs were being used to teach children in California elementary school that they had evolved from apes. That is what I find scary. Well, let's just take a look at this for just a moment. Now, it is identified here as Synanthropus pekinensis, which means China man from Peking. Remember Peking being the capital before the name was changed to Beijing, correct? Um, and then they show you this picture here. Please tell me, uh, the, the common name is simply Peking man, but does anybody here have a problem with me showing the, this photograph that they use to indoctrinate children? Anybody have a problem with that photograph? Yes? Really? That's interesting. You actually ought to pick up stones and stone me. That is not the photograph of the skull of Peking men. That is the photograph of the model of the skull of Peking men. Let me debunk this, folks. You see, these are not the original fragments. These are supposedly museum quality reproductions of the original fragments that were found. Please tell me, does that look like this? But that's what they supposedly found. Are you with me? Yeah. And let's talk about the history of Peking men. You see, uh, Davidson Black, remember he was there for the Piltdown Man? Well, Davidson Black is the man who gave it the name Peking man. But think with me for just a moment. You see, the, uh, the original work was started in 1923. It had to be stopped in 1937 because of the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. But work was started in 1923. Davidson Black came along a few years later. Um, but evolutionists got permission to go out into the countryside from the Chinese government, dig in caves. They started finding some fragments and so forth. And the work continued until 1937. But because of the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, that work had to stop. And, and uh, evolutionist anthropologists around the world begged Davidson Black to get these precious bones out of China during World War II for safekeeping so that they would not fall into the hands of the advancing Japanese army. Are you with me? Yeah. And finally, in 1941, the bones were photographed, carefully packaged up, shipped out of China, and promptly lost. <laughs> the original bones have never been seen. As a matter of fact, the museum reproduction I showed you is simply based on some photographs. And again, let's take a little look. Recent research has proven that Peking man never existed. He is now identified as Homo erectus. But in 1926, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, Jesuit priest, he was an evolutionist, and Dr. Davidson Black went there, and it is commonly accepted that they salted the site. Now, they're both connected with the hoax at Piltdown in 1912 
and this hoax in 1923. Interesting? Yeah, I think so too. Um, much more could be said, but I do want to mention Homo erectus again. Let me explain to you. Homo erectus, man who walks upright. Today, that terminology with anthropologists, it's a garbage can. It's a file 13. It's an empty pit in the ground that every time they find a bone fragment that they think might have anything to do with human evolution from apes, but they cannot prove it, they throw it into this garbage pit called Homo erectus. You with me? Now, let's take a look at that second photograph. This is a photograph from that series. It has a French name only because this is a Neanderthal skull found in France. Now, Neanderthals were first found in Germany, but also later more in France, etc. Uh, but this is a Neanderthal skull, and I would point out that um, this is what most people call a caveman. I would also like to include cave women. Come on, folks, no cave women, no cave men. Hello? <laughs> but what is the truth about Neanderthals? Now, there are slightly over 400 individuals, not, not all complete, but over 400 individual Neanderthal skeletons have been found, at least partial. And um, this, I'm sorry, they were first found in 1856. I, I thought you guys might be interested in to knowing this. Where does the word Neanderthal come from? In German, tall means valley. Neanderthal means it's the valley owned by a guy whose last name was Neander. His first name was Joachim. He was a writer of Christian hymns. And a cave in the valley he owned is where they first found Neanderthal remains. And so they named it after him, Neander Tall. Um, unfortunately, this is the newest map I've been able to get. I'm still looking for a better map, but this is the newest I can get. Where have we found Neanderthal remains? Well, of course, first in Germany, more in France, also Spain, Portugal, northern Italy, northern Adriatic, and they have been found in Israel. Neanderthal remains have been found in northern Israel at the foot of Mount Hermon. Uh, they've also been found east of the Black Sea, east of the Caspian Sea, and even out into central Siberia, but this is not the most current map. Um, actually, two things. Number one, can any of you see this rather banana-shaped object right here? That is Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal. It is absolutely stunningly beautiful. Two years ago, I was walking on it. It's, oh yes, it's easy to walk on a lake if it's got 10 inches of ice on top. And it was minus 40. But I was walking on that lake. I've done it before. I've preached on both sides of that lake. It's so long, you can't see one end from the other, but you can see from side to side. It's one of the most beautiful places you've ever been in your life. It is absolutely a natural treasure. It has more fresh water in that one lake than all the other containers of fresh water on Earth. Yeah. Now, the reason I mention that is just east of the Baikal here, there's a city called Chita. Chita. I've ministered there, taught there twice. And near Chita is the most recent discovery of Neanderthal remains. So that tells us that Neanderthals lived all the way from the Atlantic, all the way across Europe, Eurasia, all the way to east of the Baikal. Is that correct? And evolutionists want you to believe that they're uh, ape-like, pre-human, subhuman. Uh, well, that's absolutely not true. First of all, uh, Neanderthals had a brain that averaged 13% larger than ours. Now, I find it hard to believe they were subhuman with a brain 13% larger than ours. How about you? Yeah. Number two, well, they are 99.7 to 100% genetically identical to us. We have taken DNA of Neanderthals out of tooth roots, out of fingers and so forth, and they are 99.7 to 1% identical to humans today, which, by the way, happens to be closer than humans today are from each other. Today, humans vary by 4.5%. You can vary as much as 4.5% genetically and still be absolutely, totally, perfectly human. And they only, they only were three-tenths of a percent at best. And they're mentioned in the Bible. 
If you'll open up to Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations, go to verse 3. Find the word Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi. Now, Ashkenazi is uh, one of the 70 people groups created at the Tower of Babel. But the word Ashkenazi is also the ancient word for northern Germany. And today, today, when Jews make Aliyah, the return to the land of Israel, they're called the Ashkenazi. There are two great groups of Judaism in Europe, the Sephardic Jews, which lived in Spain until 1492, and the, well, the Ashkenazi Jews, which are the northern European Jews. And so they are mentioned in the Bible, hello, and, uh, and they're not only 100% human genetically, they're 100% human in activities. First of all, they had language, art, music. Yes, they did, musical instruments. Uh, they had jewelry. They were religious. They buried their dead in religious graves with religious artifacts. They hunted and gathered. That's absolutely true. And of course, evolutionists would tell you that's all they did, however, in 2015, it was proven that they also farmed. So they didn't just hunt and gather, they also farmed. And in the year 2017, we found out that they made a very sophisticated adhesive from birch bark tar. And this, I know it sounds simplistic, but this is a huge advancement in technology because it allows you to put arrowheads and spearheads on weapons and so forth for hunting and defense. Finally, in the year 2020, we found out they built houses. They didn't just live in caves, they also built houses. They did everything a human would do because they're human. Hello? And, uh, well, I want to just debunk this whole idea about Neanderthals. They's us. That's what Pogo said, anyway. Uh, now, what about cavemen and cave women? Are they found in the Bible? Are cavemen and cave women biblical? Well, let me ask you a question. If God starts the Bible on day one, week one, month one, year one, is there any such thing as prehistoric? That wasn't very demonstrative. If God starts the Bible on day one, week one, month one, year one, is there any such thing as prehistoric? There's nothing that's prehistoric. Everything is historic. And cavemen and cave women are definitely mentioned in the Bible. As a matter of fact, if you would open your Bible, you would find 31 references to men and women living in caves. I'll give you a few references and you can find the rest for yourself. But how about Lot and his daughters, Genesis 19? What about the five Amorite kings in Joshua 10? How about uh, the children of Israel, Judges 6? Samson. Now Samson was a judge of Israel, equal to the kings who would come later, correct? But in Judges 15, he lived in a cave. So doesn't that qualify Samson as a caveman? Oh. And uh, how about the great prophet Elijah? Uh, he stayed in a cave, recorded in 1 Kings 19. We even think we know the cave he lived in. We do. Although I admit to you, we didn't find any brass plaques, but we think we know where he did. Um, and uh, how about the hundred prophets of Obadiah, 1 Kings 18? The men of Israel in the cave at Michmash in 1 Samuel 13. And ladies and gentlemen, don't I seem to remember. King David lived in the cave of Adullam for months, recorded in 1 Samuel 22 and 24. So doesn't that qualify King David as a caveman? Is that right? And how about the Apostle Paul? Let's go to the New Testament. Think with me for a moment. Saul... A, well, a person who was trying to persecute the church became a Christian. But he was on his way to Damascus and met the Lord. Is that right? A very dramatic way. And he was struck blind, went to Damascus. His sight was returned to him. He went back to Jerusalem briefly. But what did he do after that? Well, if you read your Bible, he went out into the deserts of Arabia and was taught for three years only by the Holy Spirit. Is that correct? Where do you think he lived? You see, Israel, the deserts of Arabia, have thousands of caves. And he simply went out and found a nice, comfortable cave. And, and I find this interesting. He writes about the communion service as if he was actually there at the Last Supper. But of course he was not. He was a persecutor of the church at that time, correct? But he writes about it in first person. 
And I find that very interesting. So I think what happened was he went out into the Arabian desert, found a really nice, comfortable cave. And then the Holy Spirit brought in a 55-inch flat-screen TV, <laughs> you know, and he played three years of DVDs of the life of Jesus. You know, hello? <laughs> well, I mean, that's the way he writes about it. And uh, let's debunk the methodology. You see... This method of lining things up by size and shape is called the proof by ranking, R-A-N-K-I-N-G, the proof by ranking. It means to put things in a logical order or a logical sequence. And I don't care, again, whether it's, uh, well, I don't care whether it's dinosaurs or people, whatever. This is their favorite method of proof, but it is the second worst method of proof in science and proves absolutely nothing. We have approximately 100 plus people here tonight. Please do not get up. But if I asked you to, and I brought you down here, and I lined you up from one wall to the other by your height only. You know, so Tom and Jeff and I and so forth, we'll be down on this end and we'll put the, the smaller ones down. Everybody with me? Now, once I've lined everybody up in this room from the tallest to the shortest, uh, what two things would I have proven scientifically? And remember, I don't ask trick questions. I would have proved things, two things scientifically. I would have proved that people come in different heights. And I have the intelligence to do it. But what if I take the same people, the exact same people, bring you down here, and this time I line you up across the room up here by the month and the day of your birth only. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how tall you are. I don't care what your gender is, um, etc. cetera. Are you with me? I'll simply start over there with January and down here December. I'll start with January 1st there, December 3rd, 1st down here. I will line you up by 12 months. I'll go back, line you up 1 through 31 for the day of the month. Once I have lined you all up by the month and day of your birth only, uh, what two things would I have proven scientifically? I would have proven that people are born on different days of the year, and I have the intelligence to do it. Hello? Never allow them to deceive you again. The ability to line things up by size and shape proves absolutely nothing. Think with me. When I lined you up by your month and day of your birth, please tell me, did that prove anything about your heritage? Did it prove that either, any two of you were married to each other? Did it prove that any of you are fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, or cousins? No. The ability to line things up by size and shape proves nothing about your heritage. And then, of course, this proof by ranking. I like to ask good questions. You know, I only ask good questions. And so the next question is, which proof by ranking are we supposed to believe is the right one? Did you hear that question? You see, I have a collection. I've got about 36 different proof by rankings done by evolutionists. No two of them are the same. And to illustrate the point, this comes from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I went to high school in Washington, D.C., and while I was there, I used to go down to the Natural History Museum and absorb evolution, because I was an evolutionist in those days. And this comes from the Smithsonian. Now, the Smithsonian is 154% devoted to evolution, I assure you. Now, with that in mind, here we have a presentation from the Smithsonian showing supposedly the evolution of apes to people. And we just need to mention a couple of things, and then we're going to debunk the whole thing, okay? So first of all, what do we see here? Well, on the right, that's the present, that's now. And as we go back, we go back in supposedly one million year increments, back supposedly six million years. Are you with me there? Now, the bars you see here have a name with each one of the bars, and that is supposed to represent the time that this particular creature lived. And so how many of you might remember Lucy? Anybody remember the very famous fossil Lucy? Well, this is Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, and supposedly living from three to four million years ago. So here's people, and here we have these different colored bars. We have the name associated with each creature, and supposedly when it lived. Everybody with me? 
you now know everything you need to know to completely destroy this whole thing. But since I'm up here, will you let me do it? That's nice of you. So let's just take a look. Here we have these bars, and, and we've got the names and so forth. But uh, did you happen to notice that the bars are connected with dotted lines? Now, why do you connect things with dotted lines? Well, you connect things with dotted lines because you can't prove they actually connect, right? It's an attempt to prove a relationship that you think might be right but cannot prove, correct? And so you'll notice they're connected with dotted lines. Uh, and you'll notice that no two solid bars touch, but if we could prove that they actually did go from one to the other, they would touch, is that correct? Uh-huh. In addition to that, did you happen to notice the question marks? I love the question marks. We got one, two, three, four, five question marks. Boy, doesn't that just strike confidence in you? Hello? And, and I wondered, did you happen to notice there are no dotted lines connecting these two to any of this? Is that correct? And did you notice these three over here? There's a question mark and dotted lines connecting to here, but there are no dotted lines connecting to people. Is that correct? So why are these three and those two, why are those five there? There's no dotted lines connecting to people. Well, if you want to know why, please repeat just one word after me. Would you please repeat the word filler? filler. Come on, say it loud, say it proud. Filler. Why are those five there? Because they needed filler. Because, well, if you take those five off, it looks like there's less evidence for human evolution. And they want to try to convince you using stage magic, using illusion, that there's more proof than they actually supposedly have. Are you with me? I would also point out to you that in 2013, those five were reclassified as one. In one day, they lost four intermediates. Hello? And they agreed that these five are just variations within a kind, just as you are a variation within a kind. You're human, but no two of you look exactly alike. And they decided that these five were just one, and they lost four intermediates in one day. Come on, folks, aren't you impressed? And then I have a variety of these. This is another one. Uh, mostly it goes right, left, but sometimes they go up, down, you know. And so this one was very, very tall. I mean, this is taller than Jeff. And so what I had to do is cut it in half and put it side by side so that you could actually see it. Now, this is today. This is, the, this is modern times. This is the present. And going down in million-year increments, and you notice these four right here are those four right there. That's where it connects. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. So you go down to here, and then you go up here and down again, right? Back supposedly six million years. Now here you see the solid bars. Here are the names. Again, that's Lucy, you know, right there. Um, but notice, no two solid bars touch each other, correct? They're all connected with dotted lines. And let's take a look and count the question marks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Twelve question marks. Boy, doesn't that strike confidence in you? Yeah. But I want you to notice something else, folks. Did you happen to notice these three right here? That's these three, but I'm sorry, four really. But these four here are those four right there. Um, but there's no line, nothing connecting to people, right? So why are those four there? Filler. Filler. But would you please notice the evolutionists who put that particular proof by ranking together were so honest, and I do wish to compliment them, they were so honest, did you happen to notice? There are no dotted lines connecting these three to anything else. <laughs> Hello? Well, just one more. This, uh, and remember, these were all reclassified as one, but just one more of these. This comes from my beloved University of California, Berkeley, where I grew up as a child in the paleontology laboratories. And again, here we are with the present on the right going back six million years to the left. And here we have bars with the names. Again, this is Lucia Ferencis here. And this one's even got skulls. Isn't that neat? Come on, it's got skulls. That's really neat, isn't it? And, but did you notice that the evolutionists at Berkeley were so honest? They didn't even put in dotted lines. Is that correct? <laughs> but I want you to notice something else. You know, they talk about people evolving from chimpanzees, 
But did you happen to notice, if you go back six million years, it says right here that chimpanzees separated from the human evolutionary line here six million supposed years ago and went that away and have nothing to do with human evolution. But let's update this a little bit. You see, in 2011, well, they determined that actually chimpanzees didn't separate from the human line six million years ago and go that away. They actually did it uh, 13 million years ago. In one day, they pushed the separation of chimps and people back by seven million years. <laughs> Come on, that's good stuff, isn't it? And again, these were all reclassified as one. Now, this is why I said the last 10 minutes you want to be here. Uh, this is the cover of Time magazine, October 9, 2006. Um, this is the real cover. You can look it up on the internet. I have not doctored it in any way whatsoever. But Time magazine is one of the biggest promoters of evolution in the world behind National Geographic. And here on the cover, we see a, a human baby and a young chimpanzee, correct? And on the cover, it goes, how we became human. Now, down here in the white print, you might not be able to read that, so I'm going to help you. I'm going to make it bigger. But right down here below how we became human, right here it actually says, chimps and humans share almost 99% of their DNA. New discoveries reveal how we can be so alike and yet so different. And by the way, for any teacher in this room, they left off the period, I didn't. Um, but let's just take a look at this idea. Are chimps and humans 96, 97, 98, 99% the same genetically? First of all, that number 99 had no scientific foundation at all. They literally made it up. They simply went, did you see that? That's how they got 99. Now, I saw this in the hallway of an airport as I was traveling on mission work. I was walking by at full speed. I'm a trained observer. I see things that most people miss. And I saw that in a rack, and I came to a dead stop in two steps. Came back, took another look at it, got really angry. I got really angry, but I got righteously angry. Are you with me? You can be angry and sin not if it's righteous, correct? And I knew that was a bold-faced lie. And I went home. And I already knew much of the information, but I, I put it into a presentation form. Today I have 66 pages of reasons why it's not true. Relax, we're not going to do it. Uh, but what I did was I gave a summary in four pages, and I'd like to share those with you in a very easy way, okay? So, notice that I give all these citations down here at the bottom. And some of them are from Nature Magazine, the single highest scientific journal in the world for evolutionists. But let's just boil this down to a very simple reason to know it's not true. First of all, similarity may come from a common ancestor, which would be evolution, but similarity can come from a common designer, creator, God, too. Is that correct? So we're going to start with two buckets on a balance scale. Philosophically, at the moment, they're equal. We either came about from a common ancestor or from a creator god, okay? So now let's see the balance is which one's right. Well, number two, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and orangutans have 24. They have an extra pair of chromosomes we don't even have, and interestingly enough, um, well, there are 689 genes that are only found in humans and not even found in apes. Part three, the Y chromosome is what makes a boy a boy. You remember when I was teaching last night about 900 years old, and I showed you the, the photograph of the human genome, right? One X, one Y, it's a boy, right? In English, that makes it really easy. Now, notice carefully, this comes from Nature magazine, the single highest scientific journal in the world for evolutionists. The Y chromosomes are, I quote, horrendously different from each other. In human males, we are more than 58% different, gentlemen from male chimps. Um, we have 60 genes for gender, they only have 25. Ladies, you're a little closer to chimpanzees. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but you are 31% different, hello. You're only 69% the same. 
And number four, the chimpanzee genome is 11.5% larger than the human genome. They have 3.35 billion base pairs. We only have 3 billion. I remind you, humans can vary by up to 4.5% and be totally 100% normal. Uh, but I love doing mission work in the United Kingdom because in England, they actually speak English. Hello? Yeah, yeah I, love, I love going to England and, and teaching because they actually speak English. And the English have some wonderful expressions. I just love them. And the English say, let's do the maths. <laughs> yeah, they say that. Let's do the maths. And they're saying, let's do the mathematics. Please tell me, if apes have a genome that is 11.5% larger than the human, how can that only be 1% different? Let's do the maths. <laughs> well, page two. Um, in the year 2000, before the Human Genome Project was completed in 2003, before we knew anything about the ape genome, evolutionists already knew there was at least, well, comparison was not 96, 97, 98, 99. It was already down to 95.2, and that's before we even knew the human genome and knew nothing about the ape genome. Hmm. Um, then, there are only four DNA bases, which means that all life on Earth is 25% the same. When you compare things, you don't start at zero. You see, there are some things that are just necessary for life. And we all, I don't care whether you're a bacteria, a fungus, a people, uh, we all share 25% the same DNA. You don't start at zero. And... Remember that genetic similarity does not produce spiritual equivalency. Just because we have a body structure that is similar doesn't make us spiritually equivalent, correct? Page three. Well, I want to introduce you to Dr. Jerry Bergman. Now, I was with him uh, last summer out in Portland, Oregon. Um, I, I have three doctorates. He has two doctorates, but he actually has nine earned degrees. Now, that's more than me. I don't know about you. Um, he, that kind of intimidates me, frankly, <laughs> you know. Um, but his speciality is biology and microbiology. And he took a look at the two largest catalogs on Earth of known mutations in all creatures. He found nearly a half a million known catalog mutations, and he found that only 186 of them were not detrimental. They were not beneficial, but they were not, bene you know, they weren't beneficial, but they were not detrimental either. We used to call them neutral mutations. Today they call them functional mutations. But that means that 99.96% of all mutations are harmful or lethal, such as sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, etc. right? So uh, just do the math. 99.96% of mutations, which is what evolutionists claim causes an upward increase in complexity and intelligence by random chance, is actually really detrimental. Is that correct? And point nine, humans and chimpanzees only produce 29% the same proteins. 71% are different but proteins are what allows us to live. Uh-huh. Considering the whole genome, the human genome completed in April of 2003, uh, but we didn't know, we didn't know the ape genome yet uh, completely, we knew some of it, but by 2003, the comparison was down to 86.7%. So please tell me, how could three years later, Time Magazine say it was 99? But three years before that, we already knew it was down to 86.7. Did you notice the more we know, the more we know we're different? Hello? Well, just one last page. I said if you'd stay for this, you would, you'd just thank me on the way out, please. And, uh, but remember that this number comes from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA. It doesn't get higher than that in the U.S. But page four, number 11, concerning the whole genome, of the humans and apes known by September of 2005, the number of comparison was down to 80.6. Again, the more we know, the more we know we're different, correct? Now, I want to bring you up to date. 
And think about it, this is 2013. I mean, this is over 10 years ago. Over 10 years ago, we knew the genome of apes and people completely. And, well, the number is now down to 70%. We're not 96, 97, 98, 99% the same. We're only 70% the same. But that is equal to 900 million differences. Hello? Well, I just want to end the program tonight, my part of it, uh, with this. Um, you cannot compare living things based on the DNA differences and, and close relationships, etc. Um, and just to prove a point, you are only 70% the same as a chimpanzee, okay? But using this absolutely absurd method of proof, I do want you to know that you're also 50% the same as a banana. I don't know about you, I find that appealing. <laughs> and you are not only 50% the same as a banana, you are also 35% the same as a daffodil or narcissus, it's the same plant, but they're both plants the last time I looked, right? So you're 50% the same as a banana. Now when you have a sliced banana with your cereal in the morning, is that cannibalism? Just a thought, just a thought. But again, according to this absolutely absurd method of trying to compare things, you are also 88% the same as a rat. Oh, come on folks, at least it's a mammal. <laughs> but using this absurd method of comparison, you are also 60% the same as a chicken. Now, a banana is a plant, a rat is a mammal, and, uh, well, a chicken's a bird, right? But you're genetically 60% the same. So when you go to KFC, <laughs> is that cannibalism? Well, let's continue. I also want you to know that using this absolutely, utterly absurd method, you are 70% the same as a sea sponge. Wow. Which, which does beg the question, I think, right? If we're 70% the same as a sea sponge, don't you kind of have to think, maybe, we, maybe, just maybe, we really are related? <laughs> but I have one more for you. Based upon this absurd method of comparison, I want you to know that you are also 88% the same as a sea squirt. What's the matter? You don't know what a sea squirt is? And you live in Florida? and you don't know what a sea squirt is. Oh, well let me show you the picture of a sea squirt. Now, genetically, you are 88% the same as a sea squirt. Now, what is a sea squirt? Well, technically, it's an animal. And when it's a young sea squirt, by the way, remember this. I want you to tell your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren this because they're gonna love it, okay? Now, a sea squirt is technically an animal and when it's a young sea squirt, it swims through the water and it has a brain. But when it becomes an adult, it attaches to the sea floor, it becomes a filter feeder like corals and sponges, and the brain dissolves away. As an adult, it doesn't have a brain. Now, think with me for a moment. You're 88% the same as a rat, 88% the same as a sea squirt, you're 70% the same as a sea sponge, and 70% the same as a chimpanzee. So uh, Brother Bill's gonna come up here and I'm gonna ask the question, you decide which one are you closest to? <laughs> Brother Bill. I knew my wife and I were different. I just didn't know it was that deep. Let's stand together. Thank you for supporting the meetings. Thank you for coming. There's a lot of other things to do, but this is helpful. I have Christians come to me, and I, I'm with them. They say, I don't need any evidence. I just believe the Bible. Well, that's good. That's good, and so do I. Before I knew any of this, I just believed the Bible was true. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. I have peace about that. But there's nothing wrong with uh, debunking the lies of the devil. 
we know our enemy. We know his devices, which is to lie. Yeah. And this is, uh, when you meet somebody without Christ, and this is great to give them. I, in fact, I knew a European that came over here and worked with Gillespie. Uh, I forgot his name now, but what, what country was he from? And so he's from Europe working with Tom. He and his wife, if I remember right, both working with Tom as interns. In, in the veterinarian business, and he was raised an atheist. Now, we're talking raised from a child, raised an atheist, communist country. And he got a hold of uh, one of uh, the creation scientists, A-Track, I think it was, impossible A-Track, put it in to start watching. I think on the second or third one, and I may be wrong on which one, he said he shut the thing off, bowed on his knees, and asked Christ to save him. And they're still over there. They're running a veterinarian clinic, both of them born again, and they're being a witness over in the country. God's able. It's worth it. Father, thank you tonight for the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you enlighten us. Thank you for our brother who's labored many, many hours by himself to make this happen. We pray that you'd bless him, encourage him, ease his pain a little sum in the knee. We pray, God, that you'd help us to get the word out. Tomorrow, come back and finish this meeting out with, by your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name.